Cool. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, special seminar, which is uh, organized by uh, University of Michigan ERI uh, student chapter under the Friedman Family Visiting Professional Program. I'm a second year PhD student from University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada at the, from Earthquake and Structural Engineering Department. And I'm part of Student Leadership Council at the ERI. Uh, so today it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Troy Morgan. And Dr. Troy Morgan is a recognized expert in the field of seismic isolation and passive energy dissipation systems and specializes in performance of structures under extreme loading such as earthquakes, wind, flood, and explosions. He has per performed extensive research on the numerical simulation and experimental behavior of innovative seismic pro uh, protective devices and optimization of their use within performance-based er engineering frameworks. Prior to joining Exponent, Dr. Morgan was assistant professor at the Center for Urban Earthquake Engineering at the Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan. He has taught courses at the University of California, Berkeley, and San Francisco State University. He has uh, also held positions as a postdoctoral researcher at the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center and as a design engineer at Foral Assessor Engineers, Inc. Dr. Morgan received his bachelor's and MEng and PhD degrees from University of California, Berkeley. Thanks again. Uh, please, uh, I, and with that, I pass the floor to Dr. Morgan. Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, introduction. Um, that's pretty much all the background you need on, on me. Um, what, you know, today's talk is really about uh, some of, I think, my relevant experiences in the field of earthquake, uh, kind of resistant design, seismic risk mitigation. Um, you know, the, the field is evolving so much that, you know, my experiences themselves have evolved significantly. Um, so I want to share some of those with you. And really, with the aim of of looking at some lessons learned, uh, from you know, in the in the context of of projects or of problem solving, and maybe drawing some broader conclusions uh, in in the process. So I, I you know, I want to leave time for for Q and A at the end. I always find that's where the the most vibrant uh, feedback comes, and it's where I found out where I find out if you actually <laughs> heard and and enjoyed the the talk or, or or if not. So it's very important for me to to reserve time for Q and A. So I won't. Um, you know, spend too much time with prefatory remarks. Um, what I will do, and this is, uh, I think, <laughs> I, I, in part because I think I'm contractually obligated uh, to, to let you know a little bit about ERI at the national level uh, and, and answer any sort of questions and encourage you to get involved in the organization. It's a, it's, I think it's, it's the leading organization in our field um, devoted to, I would say, earthquake engineering. And the earthquake, um, I, I, would, I would say the earthquake risk mitigation field as a whole incorporating both, you know, the societal implications, the, you know, emergency response from a, you know, public health standpoint, and also traditional structural, uh, geotechnical, um, and, and metallurgical, uh, you know, engineering standpoint. So it's really is a holistic group that brings together, as the slide says, you know, engineers, geologists, social scientists, architects, planners, and, and, and the like. Um, so I, if you're not involved already, I would obviously encourage you to get involved. Um, and really the mission of ERI is, is, is simple. It, it's, it's to reduce uh, earthquake risk worldwide, um, you know, advancing the science and practice of earthquake engineering, um, improving understanding of the impact of earthquakes uh, on our environment, um, which is partly what my, my talk is about, is, is kind of creating awareness and, uh, and, and then also advocating uh, publicly, uh, you know, comprehensive and realistic measures for reducing harmful effects of earthquakes. So it's, it's a very impactful organization and one that I've been proud to be involved in um, for some time. Now, a big part of, of ERI is educating the public. And I, I show this slide to tell you that I, I've had a career, a small career of doing things on TV that no one's ever seen. Um, these are very uh, <laughs> little known TV appearances on things like the local New York City News, uh, PIX11, um, People Now, which is a you know, very widely watched uh, internet uh, people magazine program that I'd never heard of before. And then the History Channel, Engineering Disasters. Um, but these things are important because the public needs to be aware of sort of the effects of earthquakes on our environment and how we as professionals are, are addressing them um, and, and, you know, create basic awareness in, in, in places. For example, my mother lives in the Midwest, um, in, in Memphis, actually. Uh, high risk 
uh, or high area of earthquake risk, um, and un maybe unbeknownst to the public up until recently. So, uh, you know, educating the public is a huge part of ERI's mission because without an informed public, our work doesn't really get neither recognized, or more importantly, it doesn't really get implemented by the people who, that make those decisions. Um, and I think a very important program with ERI with that goal in mind is the re earthquake reconnaissance um, programs under the learning from earthquakes. And I'll, I'll give an example today of earthquake reconnaissance and the kind of things we do when we go out and investigate earthquake damage following an event, the kind of things we learn, the kind of things we observe. Um, but I would, you know, being involved and, and students are, are, are widely encouraged to get involved in this program. It gives you a chance to really go out and see firsthand the effects that, you know, large earthquakes have on our on our life, basically. Um, and there, it's a tremendous learning experience. And, and I hope that you all can, can get involved at some point in your career. Um, so benefits of membership for students. Um, I guess me being here is technically a benefit. Um, you'd be the judge of that. Um, but also the, the, um, there's a lot of uh, co competitions that are, are sponsored by ERI, including the seismic design competition, which I understand uh, many of you are already involved in, which um, was, was great to see and great to see the energy in behind that. Um, also student paper competitions where you're encouraged to either perform research on your own or, or through an advisor and, and put a paper together and, and publish it um, to get wider readership. And then fellowships. I actually was a recipient of an ERI graduate fellowship when I was a PhD student that paid for an entire year of my, of, of my schooling, um, which was to say about one fifth of it. <laughs> uh, but very important program and, and something that, that the, the organization takes very seriously. And then of course, travel grants for students to go to meetings, meet uh, fellow uh, other students and, and practicing professionals and academics. And you can read online uh, journal Spectra, which is one of the most impactful uh, earthquake, uh, I would say uh, in the earthquake field, spanning geology, engineering and social science. It's, it is the most impactful, uh, one of the most impactful uh, journals out there. So um, all benefits of, of membership. So I encourage you to join. That's my, that's my short pitch. And if you have any questions, obviously, please reach out to, to me. Uh, my contact information will be made available um, and I'll, I'll, I can set you in the right direction. Um, okay, I wanna jump right into it. Um, you know, a few projects I wanted to talk about and, and learn some lessons uh, along the way. One of them was a, a fascinating project I was involved in uh, at Exponent in my current job and it involved uh, nuclear safety. And this is actually a field I've been involved in now for about 10 years. Um, this one has some unique aspects to it. So to set the stage uh, in San Diego, uh, well, between LA and San Diego technically, um, is the um, uh, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, also known as SONGS, which sounds much nicer, um, especially for a nuclear plant. And um, you know, importantly, it's, uh, in, it is located in a seismically active area. Uh, and there were two units, units two and three, that were in operation um, at the time that this project uh, was undertaken. Um, also as a bit of as history, uh, in March of 2011, there was a very large offshore earthquake in the Northeast of Japan called the Tohoku, Great Tohoku earthquake. Um, and it affected uh, a wide uh, kind of, I would say a wide coastal area of, of Japan uh, in terms of both ground shaking, but probably more devastatingly was the, the effects of the tsunami that were generated. So. The, the Togo earthquake was actually uh, undersea. It was about 100 kilometers off the coast of Japan. And with large subduction zones and subduction faults, a rupture actually, uh, instead of moving side to side, it's actually a massive crust is, is thrust upward. And that upward movement actually ejects a volume of water vertically and then creates a ripple effect that then propagates outwards and causes very large uh, waves. In these case, 40 foot waves in some coastal areas. Um, when, once they reach land. And so at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, which is a TEPCO facility, a Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, this, this facility was subjected to a 40 foot high wave and it was only protected by a 20 foot high seawall. So it doesn't take a significant amount of engineering analysis to realize that that wave um, was much larger than the, the capacity, let's say of the wave protection system. And as a result, the emergency diesel generators in part, there's, there's a lot of effects, um, but one of the effects was that the diesel generators in the basement um, or in the lowest levels of the plant were basically flooded. And that flooding uh, after the loss of offsite power, that flooding rendered those emergency generators useless. And it was unable to supply power to the pumps that circulated the coolant that then keep the reactor core um, uh, within a, a tolerable or acceptable temperature. 
So that's the, that, that's the, the backdrop. Now, as a result, in the US, the, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, issued a response that basically told all operators that they need to do what's called a walk down, um, which is to basically look at all conditions in a plant and look for potential uh, risks um, associated with seismic shaking. And these could be from, from any source. And so as uh, one of these walk downs was actually performed at San Onofre um, in compliance with federal regulations. And so that kind of kicks this project off. So importantly, as part of the plant's backup system, there's basically four uh, diesel generators that are just sitting idly waiting for, waiting for action. Uh, you test them once a week to make sure that they're operational, um, but otherwise they just sit there. And if there's a loss of offsite power from the grid, uh, which powers things like pumps and, and other uh, safety critical equipment, these generators kick in and provide power to those components. Now these generators, as I'll discuss, are equipped with this special vibration monitor or this little device that's mounted to the top, which measures vertical movement. And the point is, if the, if the rotational movement is excessive, let's say there's a loss of, of, of a part of the, uh, you know, as a part of the rotational equipment that causes, say, eccentric loading, it'll cause excessive vertical vibration, and that is a sign of malfunction. And then this vibration monitor will, will read that movement and then shut the power off to the generator so it doesn't basically blow itself up. However, during one of these walkdowns, uh, a rather astute member of, of the team looked at that generator and said, so what happens if there's an earthquake? <laughs> that thing's also gonna move. Is it gonna move and then shut the power off to this generator at a time when perhaps it's, it's needed the most? And the operator said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, that's, a really, that's a really good question. And, and there was other issues going on at the plant at the same time. Um, so I, which I'll get into in a second, but our, 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 our mission in this case was basically, all right, Go back and figure out if an earthquake had occurred in the past, would the, gener would the generator have shut off accidentally? Um, if yes, that would be a problem because the plant itself was already um, having some regulatory problems due to the steam generators, which is a separate talk entirely. Um, but it would, you know, finding that there was a, a, a non-compliance issue with this vibration monitor would have, would have, uh, initiated what's called a red finding, which is kind of like um, if you're if you're in high school and, you're, and you, you know, maybe you get a speeding ticket, your parents might say, listen, you clearly don't know how to operate this vehicle. I'm going to take the keys away until you can demonstrate that you've got the responsibility to, uh, to drive this thing properly. Um, that's kind of what what the regulators did here. They said, you know, you've had a couple issues here, we, you know, potential issues. You need to convince us that that this plant is essentially risk free, uh, given the license. If the answer was no, then there's no real issue to report uh, other than to report to the NRC that it's been investigated and has been dispositioned. Um, so we, we looked at that problem. We were hired basically to help them, with, help them out. And so we proposed this simulation where we uh, you know, model the, the vibration transducer itself, so this little device that measures movement, um, model the building that the generator sits in and all the underlying soil, because all that's important in terms of simulating how much vibration is happening in the generator. Um, and that included producing the, the right ground motions to characterize the, the seismic hazard or the seismic environment. Um, and then we also had to model the, the trip circuitry. Because remember this, this vibration measurement device, it measures movement and then it spits out a voltage. And that voltage then goes to a series of signal conditioners and relays. And then there's a, a control system, um, which is an electrical system that takes that measurement and then makes a decision, do we trip this thing off because it's malfunctioning or do we not? And that's, the, that's kind of how things work. <clears throat> so this is a really interesting multidisciplinary group effort. So within my company, we have a lot of different um, engineering and scientific uh, groups and practices. And these are, these are, those, these are them listed. We, we kind of brought in our electrical engineering folk to look at the circuitry. We brought in our thermal sciences people who had some experience with, with the, the generators themselves uh, and how they you know, power the pumps and the coolant. And also my department, which is the building and the structures group, which is really where the, the analysis was, was, was the heaviest. Um, so here's a picture of one of these diesel generators. Like I said, there's four of them. And at the top, you've got this vibration probe or this um, transducer, which is what measures the vertical motion. And here's a close up of that. Um, so this sensor is mounted to a crossbar, which is then welded to the, to the generator itself. And so here's my little PowerPoint sketch of that. Um, and so really the, the situation is you've got a concrete floor slab, you've got soil underneath it, 
and that's not what I intended to do. Um, and then you've got the generator sitting on top, and then you've got the velocity sensor up here, which is where the which is where the motion is is measured. And so if you look at this sensor, it actually has some nice properties. It's basically a mass, which is the the coil. Well, it's a steel um, steel element wrapped in a coil that then passes through a magnet and just through Faraday's law from basic physics, if you move a coil through a magnet, you'll generate a voltage uh, as a result based on the velocity. And so that mass is attached to the housing via springs and dampers. And if you studied a bit of dynamics, you know that springs, masses, and dampers are like our favorite things to, to work with because you can model almost anything like that. And in fact, this is already set up to be a perfect SDOF modeling problem. So that was one of the few um, convenient aspects of this project. Um, but we also had to look at the fact that under normal operation, this mass really would just be vibrating up and down. But given an earthquake, there might be excessive vibration, which might cause impact of this mass against the housing. And that would not be intended and wouldn't be, um, would, would require some special modeling to, to, to look at it. <clears throat> so the sequence of events is this. You have a vertical ground motion from an earthquake. Um, and it only, I say vertical only because it measures vertical motion, not that the earthquake itself has to be um, only acting vertically. Of course, earthquakes shake in three dimensions. Um, and then you get a voltage signal that comes out as a result of the shaking. That voltage signal goes to a vibration monitor. That vibration monitor then sends a signal to a trigger. This is called an agostat relay. And it basically measures the amount of charge that gets stored up over time. And if it exceeds a certain amount for a certain duration, it says, all right, this thing's malfunctioning, trip it off. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, it says, no, 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 it's fine. You don't need to trip it off. Just let the thing keep running. So we had to basically simulate this whole thing and figure out, is there a trip or not given an earthquake, not given normal vibrations. So the analysis problem is actually simple. It's given a ground acceleration input at the base. What is the voltage output at the sensor? That's the structural analysis problem. And so the approach was basically develop these ground motions, develop the acceleration records that might happen at the base, and then get a, develop a numerical model that simulates the entire structure, the generator, and this little vibration sensor, which will then transform a velocity into a voltage. So all those are important components, and I'll just get into it piece by piece. So the first step was to develop the actual ground motions. And this was to characterize the kind of motions we might see at the site, given the seismic uh, potential seismic intensity, which is a function of the length of the fault, um, which is rupture length, um, which magnitude is related to the rupture length. Um, and also the distance. Um, shaking intensity is a function not only of magnitude, but also of distance from the source to the site. So we were looking at somewhere between five and 15 kilometers distance. And then also the soil type or the soil properties, which is typically measured at least in my crude way as a non-geotechnical engineer via something like the shear wave velocity, um, say of the upper 30, uh, 30 feet or 10 meters. And so we came up with a suite of 16 ground motions from actual events from around the world that kind of met these criteria. And these are the three kind of columns that correspond to magnitude, source, distance, and soil type. And then these are the ground motion spectra that we came up with for these three. And it had to be, we, it's important when you characterize earthquake ground motions to look at a range because there's so much uncertainty involved with what the actual shaking might be given a certain scenario of earthquake. Um, the only thing you can guarantee when you read an earthquake record is that that will never happen again. <laughs> That's the only time it's ever occurred. So there's really not much point in relying on a single record when you're trying to do kind of a risk assessment. Um, so we, we characterize this based on its uncertainty, including the median spectra and then the upper and lower percentiles and to ensure that this was compatible with the seismic hazard at the site. So we had to generate the building response. Now, the really interesting part of this project, and this happens sometimes, especially in my field where I'm doing a kind of a, a, an investigation of something in the past, is that you, you, you have to use the tools sometimes that were available to the engineers at the time that they did the design. Because the question is, did they meet the requirements of the license? And the license was issued, say, in the 70s, and you can't hold the operator to a standard that didn't exist back when they were first doing this work. And so we basically went back and we recreated the structural analysis model of the ge diesel generator building um, using the original calculations, which were from the 70s. And so the idea here is you apply a free field motion here. That's what the ground is doing. And then it propagates through these little springs. And these are translational springs and rotational springs, which simulate both the up, down, side to side motion of the building, but also the rocking. So the pitch, roll, and yaw. So it's, it's basically a six DOF model at the base. And then all these little masses and sticks 
and they are called stick models, you know, for obvious reasons. These are meant to simulate the dynamic properties of the building itself. So this is how it was done. And, uh, and so we recreated such a model and figured out what, given that free field motion at the base, what the vertical motion would be at the sensor so we can get the, the voltage. All right, so we had a model of velocity sensor. And so we asked the operator of the plant to send us one and they sent us this. Um, this is a dismantled and destroyed sensor, um, which wasn't really useful necessarily for us um, because we wanted to actually test it and figure out what it did under different types of, of, of input motions. Uh, and one important thing about this is the specs had what the peak to peak allowable motion was. So how much motion vertically could take place of that mass before it would impact the housing. Um, and you'll see where that comes in in a moment. So the problem is simple. Um, given a velocity, which is some kind of a harmonic signal, which here we just characterize in the normal way, given the frequency f of the input, um, then used out from that would become a voltage, which is really just a uh, amplification of the input signal by some transfer function, which is to say a, an amplitude modification factor that's a function of frequency. So that's the way transfer these transfer functions work, or they work in general. Um, the thing is we had pretty good data already from the way the sensor behaves in the high frequency range because that's where it was intended to behave. We didn't have much in the lower frequency range, which is where earthquake uh, inputs are, uh, are predominant. And so we really needed to, to test the data uh, at the lower frequency range. Um, and then the other issue we had was that they're, uh, you know, using, using frequency domain analysis is only really valid for linear systems. It's strictly valid for linear systems. So if we had impact, we would have to change our approach as well. Um, so uh, we took the sensor, we put it on our this, one of the smallest shake tables I've seen, which is in our laboratory in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but small, but you know, got the job done. We weren't testing a very large structure here. Um, so mounted the sensor on top. Um, this is again the one that they actually sent after they they went and pulled one off that was actually intact that hadn't been uh, dismantled. Um, and so we we we. Uh, characterized this transfer signal over the range of frequencies. So we got the data in this range. And we did that basically by running a test in the shake table and measuring the voltage output. So under like small levels of, of motion, say 10 Hertz frequency, but only one inch per second velocity, you get a perfectly harmonic output, which is to say harmonic input, harmonic output, that's a linear system. Um, when we started to go to larger velocities, which were very realistic in terms of earthquake shaking, we started to get obvious impact of the soil, uh, sorry, of the coil rather, with the with the casing. Um, and so this impact really is a sign of a nonlinear system. And then this impact becomes more pronounced as we go to higher levels of, of velocity and amplitude. <clears throat> and so what we had to do then was we had to develop a time domain model. And so we did in open seas, we created an impact model that, that faithfully replicated um, given our experiments, how much voltage would be spit out of this sensor given a certain input velocity. Um, okay, so now we have our simulation set up. Now we need to test the actual module. And so we set this up in, in our lab. Um, this is one of our labs in California, but we, we actually took the, 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 the hardware that was in place at the plant, which they also sent to us via FedEx, um, hooked it up to a breadboard and oscilloscope and actually started running voltages that we got from our open seas model and ran those voltages now through the oscilloscope and then into the signal conditioner to see what it would do. And what we found, so the way this works is you get the voltage that comes in through this signal conditioner. And then there is a capacitor which would store the charge. And if, it's, if the stored charge exceeds a threshold for a certain amount of time, then the relay says, oh, malfunction, shut it down, turn it off. And so that was our simulation was we would measure the amount of time that the earthquake shaking caused the capacitor to exceed this threshold. Um, and this duration, we would measure it and decide yes or no. Either was was it? And it was by the way, it was five seconds was the threshold um, for trip. The reason it was I asked them why five seconds, and they said, "Oh, well, that's because that's what the dial was set to." And I said, "Yeah, but what was the dial set to that?" And like, it was it was the max. It was the biggest number on there, so we set it to that. So I was like, "Okay, sounds good." Um, so we did our tests and we measured the duration of the trigger for different sensor types and for all 16 of the ground motions. And what we found was that for none of the seismic inputs um, did the trigger signal last longer than five seconds. And so we were able to, uh, so 
you know, this encompasses a wide variety of shaking. It's not a deterministic analysis. We didn't just look at one earthquake. This was sort of considering a range of realizations of, of, of the design of earthquake, which is a one in 10,000 year event, according to the NRC, um, or according to the guidelines that the NRC follows. Um, so given all that, we didn't uh, observe any trips to this. Um, and so we concluded that then the earthquake would not have sh shut off this generator, um, which, you know, was an important conclusion for them. Uh, it turns out they've uh, decommissioned this plant anyway, <laughs> for reasons totally unrelated to this. So while interesting and certainly a learning experience, and it brings up some interesting, uh, you know, ideas about seismic risk in nuclear plants, um, ultimately didn't have much effect because they ended up shutting it down anyway. Um, and so maybe a little deflating, I suppose, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, but I, you know, the, the lesson here is that you know, with, when you have like a, a, this mechanical system that has a sensor, there's a lot of very weird failure pathways that can happen that may not be envisioned by the designers at the time. And it, you know, as, our, as these systems, and I've worked on a lot of nuclear plants now, and there are a lot of interconnected systems that we think we know all the failure pathways, and we think we know kind of what sequence of say failures along a fault tree will lead to say core meltdown. If there's one that we don't think about, then that totally changes our risk assessment. And you know, something that as engineers, you know, who are trying to design things in the future, uh, we need to be aware that we, you know, we need to be creative in how we envision the ways that our systems might fail. And it's very, it's very critical in terms of you know infrastructure like nuclear plants or emergency command centers or hospitals, schools, and 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 things like that. Um, so that's 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 a. I think that's a, a, an area of research and certainly an area of practical interest is, is how do we prevent low consequence, but very highly, um, or sorry, low frequency, but very highly, um, you know, high consequence failures, like, like core meltdown of a, of a nuclear plant. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on, on uh, earthquake reconnaissance, which is something I mentioned earlier in the talk, and is, it's something I've had a chance to do twice. Um, the first time I did earthquake reconnaissance was in New Zealand, and this was following the 2011 earthquake in Christchurch, which is on the Southern Island. Um, this happened in February of 2011. I went there from Japan where I was living at the time. Uh, I went there to, to, to do a week long uh, reconnaissance mission, partly funded by ERI. I went back to Japan. And then on March 11th, less than a month later, we had our extremely large earthquake. And that gave me the second opportunity to do earthquake reconnaissance. Um, so it was it was a rather it was a rather intense 2011. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. By the way, I moved to New York in 2012, and then we had Hurricane Sandy, which was the largest economic natural disaster to hit the hit the the Northeast. So I promised people I would tell them when I was going to move again. <laughs> um, I learned a lot about storm surge and 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 uh, wind versus versus water effects on on infrastructure. Um, yeah, so so New Zealand, uh, this earthquake, interestingly. This was an aftershock. Uh, I think it's now been agreed upon. It was there was some. I think there was long ago there was some um, dis, uh, maybe dispute or disagreement as to whether this was a, a main shock or an aftershock. I think it's agreed this was an aftershock to the one that happened in um, September of the previous year of 2010. Think about this aftershock though: is the magnitude was smaller than the main, which is it had to be to be an aftershock, but also it was very close to the central business district of Christchurch. Six point, uh, sorry, nine kilometers. And it was also very shallow. The depth below the, the surface was only five kilometers. Uh, and five kilometers is a very shallow earthquake. Um, and so uh, kind of a, a moderate size earthquake of 6.3, but at a very shallow depth and very near to a, an area that has a lot of infrastructure, particularly old infrastructure, um, is kind of a recipe for significant uh, earthquake effects and, and displacement of, of people and businesses. Uh, and that is what happened. So this was a typical street in New Zealand, in, in Christchurch rather, I took this picture. Um, and, and, and this was not an uncommon thing to see just walking down through the CBD, the Center of Business District. And you know, a lot of the buildings there are characterized by um, unreinforced or lightly reinforced masonry structures, um, older concrete buildings, um, sometimes uh, with uh, insufficient reinforcement in terms of the spacing between the shear ties. Um, and also, you know, reinforcement in the joint to, to provide ductility. Uh, these are all very classic vulnerabilities in our built environment. Um, and this, unfortunately, was a, a means of, of sort of reminding ourselves of that 
um, and also you know, trying to learn a little bit uh, of what we can do better in the process. So a lot of the kind of failures we saw in Christchurch were things like this, you know, damage to modern reinforced concrete buildings. These are buildings that were built in, you know, the 90s, 2000s. Um, you know, these are buildings that could have been, you know, 10 years old or less, which was certainly modern. Um, the thing about this damage is, while very disruptive, you couldn't you couldn't go back into these buildings afterwards. You couldn't conduct business there. You couldn't live there. Um, these entirely met the uh, the objectives of the building codes. Okay. In a very large earthquake, our building codes are set up to only target the uh, preservation of life through what's called life safety. Um, there's no real assumption of reparability, um, damage avoidance or damage uh, prevention. Um, this is the kind of performance that we want in earthquakes. We want the building to get damaged, but not to fall over and not to kill anyone. Um, <clears throat> we saw some, some other interesting things I observed personally were, were streets that didn't have the same type of damage patterns, even though they were 10, 15 meters apart. <laughs> um, and this was a street where most of the building stock was be built before 1931. And interestingly, there was an earthquake, a major earthquake in, in, called the Napier earthquake in New Zealand. And this earthquake actually triggered the profession to change some of their seismic design approaches. Um, and that's part of the reason why uh, the damage, say, on this street, where you had pre-Napier buildings, was quite a bit different than this street, which I think two blocks away, um, that had very little damage to the facades or to the buildings themselves. Most of the damage was actually due to liquefaction. Um, so due to settlement, uh, which is what you're seeing here with the, the hardscape being being offset. Um, so this is why we learned from earthquakes, actually, is that we can avoid making the same mistakes. And perhaps after the next big earthquake, um, you know, we're not going to see, we're not going to make the same mistakes over and over again. Um, someone's printing on my printer. Um, so. This is a, I say, I show this slide to, to give you a context for how big this earthquake was. So the, the, the main shock in September of 2010, the spectra was actually below the design spectrum for a typical building in Christchurch for most of the, for most of the frequency range um, out until you get into the long period range, let's say more than say one second or, or more. So these are more of like tall buildings that are out here. <clears throat> so the, uh, however, the aftershock, which was again smaller but closer and shallower, was quite a bit above the design spectrum. This is a log-log scale, right? So this is quite a bit higher than the design spectrum in some cases. And this is the frequency range or the period range of, say, you know, one to five-story buildings, which were most of these masonry structures. Um, and this is really important because, you know, the results were of this earthquake that over 50% of the buildings in the central business district were ultimately had to be demolished. Um, and that was considered acceptable by the codes, but you know the public didn't really feel that way. The public thought rightly that you know an entire city shouldn't be shut down for months after an earthquake, um, even if the if the fatalities were low, and they were. Um, there was a, a couple tragic um, uh, exceptions to that. There was a few buildings that did collapse that caused loss of life, um, but overall it was really property damage. And so that's why these days uh, we really are are going towards risk based design of structures. And this is a the classic risk integral, um, which is the probability of failure is, is basically taking the exposure of a, of, a, of a structure, that is what the likelihood is it will fail given some amount of shaking, multiplied by the probability that that shaking will occur. So it's kind of like the exposure or the, the effect if something bad happens times how often does something bad happen. Um, and I'll get to probabilities again, or, or fragilities again at the end. But really, you know, the hazard is something that is a function of mother nature. It's something that's based on the geology and the soil. It's not something that we as engineers can do a whole lot about. Um, but we can do a lot about the exposure. We can do a lot about what the performance is like given an earthquake. We can't do anything about how, how often that earthquake will happen right here where we're sitting. Um, but we can figure out, we can, we can change the, the fragility or the, the probability of failure given that earthquake. And so there's a lot of technologies that are being used. And you know, my specialty is base isolation or other control devices like passive dampers, which are really just like viscous you know, fluid being forced through an orifice, like a shock absorber in a, in a car. Um, there's also been some work, and I, I know Jason McCormick and some others have done work on you know, recentering systems, which are really, um, have gained a lot of traction for good reason. Uh, you know, damage after an earthquake is a lot of times a function of what the residual deformation is. The building may move a lot during the earthquake and there may be some non-structural damage, but as long as it comes back to center, the repairs uh, can often be done uh, in such a way that it's, it's you know, cost effective. Whereas if the building is permanently out of plumb, um, there may be no practical way to repair it and it may be demolished. 
Uh, and so, you know, these, these kind of systems, these advanced per performance systems are really meant to do better than the building code. It's not just about saving lives anymore. It's really about mitigating the uh, economic losses uh, that may result. And that's of interest to society because I think a lot of people already thought we did that. <laughs> they already thought when we design a building for the building code, it's quote, earthquake proof. It's not gonna be damaged and it's not the case. Um, so isolation is a technique and I won't spend time on this too much, but it's, you know, instead of the building shaking around um, and being fixed to the ground, it just kind of allows the ground to sort of float underneath it. And uh, I have a you know simple video to illustrate that. Um, you know, conventional buildings, they, they move um, typically at a, at a rather high frequency um, or short period, and the deformation is in the building itself, whereas in an isolated building, that deformation is all concentrated down at the base. And at the base, we have these very nice devices made of either rubber and steel or, or sometimes a, a, a Teflon slider inside of a dish, and that gives it the flexibility to really absorb deformation um, in a place where you can design for it and leave the structure otherwise um, largely undamaged. Um, I'm gonna skip this, just another video. This is, this is I, I told some of you about a, uh, an experience I had um, in Japan where we, we, we created a model of a hospital. And this is a, a hospital on a shake table. And this is a full scale hospital, by the way, um, full scale ground motion, and these are full scale base isolators. And I'll just show it again. What we're really trying to show is what the performance of the structure itself is, but also what is the performance of the non-structural components and the contents, all right? Is, is stuff gonna be toppled all over the place? Are the ceiling tiles gonna be dislodged and sitting on the ground? Because for a hospital, for a hospital, that would affect the ability of staff to treat patients after an earthquake. So it's very important to characterize not only the performance of the buildings, but the performance of the stuff inside the buildings, which is probably key to its continued operation. Um, so really what we're doing with kind of high performance systems is we're, we can't do anything about the hazard, but we're taking the fragility and we're kind of moving it not only over to the right, which is to say for a particular input, we have a lower probability of failure, but we're also narrowing the bounds of uncertainty. Um, Cause don't forget, um, you know, devices like isolators and dampers, they're all tested before they go into a structure. All right. We don't test every concrete shear wall. We don't test every steel moment frame before we install it. Um, we couldn't. Um, but we can test every we test every isolator and we test every damper before it, it gets installed, and, and that sort of not only improves the performance but improves the uncertainty on the performance. So I think that's a key a key lesson I think from Christchurch um, and other earthquakes that we've seen. Um, okay, I'm uh, kind of last case study about earthquakes. Um, after I moved to New York, I got called on a case and related to the the 2011 Virginia earthquake down in Mineral, um, outside of Richmond. And the, the, this is from Perez Hilton, which I still don't know who he is, to be honest, but, um, but the, you know, it was big news. Earthquake happens in the East Coast. That should never happen, right? Like earthquakes are only a California thing. Um, it, it, definitely not. Uh, the USGS was not uh, uh, surprised by this earthquake. Um, and one thing about East Coast earthquakes that's really important to know is that the nature of the geology causes the, the earthquake waves to travel much longer distances. Um, before they get attenuated and before they decrease. So for similar size earthquakes happening in California versus Virginia, the number of people who feel that earthquake is much broader geographically because these waves can travel longer distances before basically decaying. By the way, this person in Texas did not feel that earthquake. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Um, that truck drove by and they went to the USGS website and, and put it into their system. Um, but that said, this is an indication that you know, a damaging earthquake, let's say in the East Coast, can really cause a lot of regional loss uh, compared to say one in, a, in an area like California that has much younger and more fractured uh, geology. Um, so this is, a, this, is a funny, uh, this is a funny story about earthquakes. Um, I got called uh, out to a, a, a summer camp out in New Jersey. Um, and as part of the summer camp, as most summer camps, there's these three swimming pools on the premises. And, um, you know, the, the organizers of the camp, like in, in late August uh, or mid August, they pack it all up and they go home for, for until the next summer when they can, you know, set it up again. Um, and, and they did, they, they left around August 15th or 16th of 2011 and they, they vacated for, you know, until the following spring. And that's, that's part of the story. So they came back in April of 2012, they came to the, 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 the site and they said, wow, there's like concrete cracking and damage everywhere. What's going on? 
Um, and so I got that call and I went out and I measured all these cracks and I looked at the, the damage that they were, they were um, reporting and they were saying, you know, maybe this is the earthquake. We, we don't, we don't, you know, a lot of this damage we don't think was here. And I said, ah, okay, that's, that'd be surprising, but um, let's, let's check it out. So I, I went out there and took all these measurements and, to, you know, recorded my observations and then, and then got to work. So first thing I always do and, and, uh, you know, is, is, is look at what the shake maps from the USGS would have suggested that the, the uh, intensity of shaking would have been at that summer camp. So I went to the USGS shake map, and this is based on, you know, limited sensor data and other modeling tools. They estimated what's called the modified mercality intensity or MMI of the, of the, of the, of the shaking over the entire Northeast. Um, well, and further, further South as well, but Importantly, they measured MMI of around, let's say this is a light blue range, kind of weak to light. Um, and really the damage under this kind of shaking should be extraordinarily small. Um, you, you really don't expect to see structural or non-structural damage for MMI of three or, or four. Um, so that was kind of one clue. Is this earthquake related? I, you know, It's not looking like it. Um, not to mention that the damage patterns weren't really earthquake related, but you know, you know, trying to be thorough for a, for a client. Um, thankfully, at, at Drexel University in Philadelphia, they had a strong motion recording station. I was able to pull that data and saw that the vertical motion at the site, at Drexel rather, uh, was about 0.007G, which is about 0.7% G. Um, that's probably like somebody walking down the hallway um, outside your apartment. It, it's, it's, it's pretty low. It's pretty low. Not, not likely to cause damage. Um, but the other thing that I found was the website. And the website for the summer camp, um, they show photos that they publish, you know, for all the parents to see, because the parents send their kid to camp for a week. They want to see pictures showing that the kid's actually doing something fun um, and not just, you know, locked in a basement somewhere, um, you know, reading, uh, I don't know, <laughs> literature that they wouldn't care to understand. Um, so this is great. There's pictures of the, of the, of the whole camp from the summer. And all these pictures were taken between June 15th and August 19th. And the earthquake itself happened on August 23rd. So every single picture predates the occurrence of the earthquake. So I, I pulled those pictures up. And so I looked at them and noticed, well, that crack, and there's kids in the pool, so clearly it was before the earthquake. That crack looks familiar. And so I went back to my notes and yeah, sure enough, this is the exact same one, same location. You can see that the, the joint on the coping is here. This is the same joint that's actually over here. Um, so that was, you know, it was interesting. I uh, went to this picture, saw some signs of scaling and spalling on the, on the surface. Um, that was also very similar to what I saw when I went out there. Um, <clears throat> certain crack that happened right around the, the pole anchorage uh, of the railing. Also, that was the same one. So, you know, it's a way to use some rather non-technical techniques to conclude whether damage was in fact caused by an earthquake or not. Um, so there's all the scientific approach that I took at the beginning to look at intensity of shaking and, and uh, you know, what, what USGS would say and what the Drexel sensors suggested. But ultimately, sometimes you just go to the internet and pull up some pictures and figure it out that way. Um, so I want to finish just, and I want to spend only a couple of minutes on this, you know, the field of earthquake engineering it has had a lot of innovations. And one of those innovations is introducing probabilistic thinking into the way we design infrastructure that is recognizing that earthquakes are, well, they're rare, but they're also, um, unpredictable. And so we can't design things using a deterministic approach where, whereas we assume, okay, this earthquake is going to happen. And this is when it's going to happen. I'm going to design my building or my bridge for that thing. Uh, for that load and, and, and be done with it. Um, that thinking has, has, has now migrated into, into many other places. And uh, I was talking to Professor uh, Seymour Spence and some of his students about his work, which is squarely in this, in this area. Um, so one thing we're doing at my firm at Exponent is we're helping California utility, uh, PG&E in particular, Pacific Gas and Electric, we're helping them deal with their wildfire problems. And the wildfires in California are you know, a lot of them are being caused by high wind events that are affecting the electrical infrastructure. So transmission towers and, the, and electrical lines that connect those towers. During high wind events, they either cause collapse of the tower, um, which then ca can cause an ignition to the uh, you know, surrounding uh, wildlands, um, or 
uh, moving in the cables themselves, if they're too close to foliage, might cause an ignition and then cause a fire for that reason. This is a, a major problem and there's climate issues at play. Um, but the fact is we have a vulnerable infrastructure that is uh, way too susceptible to, to fires. And we're helping pg e solve this problem by using some old fashioned earthquake engineering techniques. Um, so really what we're doing is we're doing kind of risk-based assessment of utility assets. These are things like these steel transmission towers. We're also looking at wood, wood poles, um, also vulnerable. And there's, there's, you know, thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of them. But the question is really, how can these resources, how can pg e resources, financial resources be allocated best to manage the risk of wildfire? Um, and, and without just shutting down the power to all the Californians, because I mean, having been from there, I can tell you that would not go over very well at all. Um, and so that's what we were trying to help them solve is, well, where can you, you know, from an engineering perspective, where can you invest in repairs or upgrades in such a way that you have the biggest benefit to the likelihood, you know, say the biggest decrease to the likelihood of, of wildland fires? Um, and how do we quantify that? So, you know, what we're doing is really we're, we're helping them to start with, we're developing like fragilities for these, for these towers. And one of the many inputs, you know, one of them is, is um, you know, corrosion susceptibility. What for a particular asset, for a particular tower in a particular location, what's the you know susceptibility to or prevalence of corrosion given the environment? And that's probably limited ocean, which you know drives up the uh, you know chlorine content, uh, proximity to industrial areas, which drives up the sulfur dioxide content, and then things like temperature and humidity, <clears throat> all of which are inputs into the likelihood of an of a of a steel member of this lattice structure, say being corroded and having a decrease in its overall uh, wind capacity. Um, so what we've been doing is then for a particular asset, we first of all, we look at the hazard at the site. That is, this is the frequency of exceeding a certain wind speed. So, you know, for example, the 100 year wind storm, which is 10 to the minus two, so one over 100 is the annual frequency. You go over and look down, okay, that's about 81 miles an hour. That's, an, that's a, a, a way of expressing wind hazard or the likelihood of exceeding a wind speed. Um, and then we also would like to know in our, again, this is the same integral as before, um, We've got the hazard, which is again, something that nature provides, not something we can do a lot about, but we can also characterize, all right, what's the fragility of one of these towers? That is, what's the likelihood of failure given, and failure, by the way, can be failure of a, of a steel component. It can be failure of a, of, a, you know, of, a, of a porcelain bushing or of a conductor. There's a lot of components here that could fail. Um, and the way these work is, you know, like for example, the median failure speed of say 101 miles an hour is just going the fragility curve, finding 50%, uh, which is the median, and then coming over and reading off what the capacity is. You know, given these two, the hazard and the fragility, we can, like before, with my earthquake example, we can calculate the risk of failure of this component, or say of this, syst of this system, which is of many components, given all the fragilities. And so what we can do then is we can measure the wildfire risk by say, doing a qualitative analysis, you know, the consequence uh, of a windstorm is either low, medium, or high, that is, there's really no chance of igniting anything versus, yes, this could ignite a large area and cause damage to urban uh, environments and cause you know, fatalities and, and, and economic loss. And then there's how frequency is such an event. Um, do, these, do these wind events happen all the time or do they happen uh, you know, fairly rarely? Um, and then given that, uh, you know, and we simulate for all the different assets, all the different uh, transmission towers, where does it fall? Is it you know, when this wind, wind event happens a lot uh, and it's also uh, has very bad consequences, well, that would be high priority. <laughs> That's something you want to deal with right away. Whereas for an asset where, uh, you know, or even for a high or for, even for low frequency wind, it has very low consequences. There's, you know, even for a super high wind, it's really not going to either not going to collapse probably, or if it does, it's not going to not likely to cause an ignition. Um, that would then be considered very good. And that would be low priority for the utility to, to, to do something with. Um, and then you can sort of rank these things uh, by asset in terms of which ones you know, have the most number of homes at risk given say the, the likely win to occur. Um, and so we're, you know, we're helping pg e kind of go through and figure out, all right, if we uh, repair certain assets, how much does that change? The, you know, how many say transmission towers along a circuit might fail given this sort of a forecast wind event. And then given a forecast, they say, hey, tomorrow we've got 70 mile an hour winds in this area. You can go to this, to this data that we, that we produce and then pg e can look at and decide whether or not 
these need to be either degenerized, de-energized de um, in the case of a weak asset um, until repairs can be made in such a way to kind of minimize the overall risk along this electrical circuit. Um, so, you know, very um, kind of practical, immediate problems that we're trying to deal with in California related to fires, which the techniques are totally taken from what's been happening in the earthquake engineering world um, for as long as I've been involved. But they, it's really come, come a long way and it's, a, you know, it's heartening to see these techniques being used in practice because that's really what they were meant for. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be strictly an ex academic exercise. Um, and it, it's, it's moved much, much beyond that, which is, is I think we should all be, be happy about. So, you know, that's it. I managed to leave a fair bit of time for, for Q&A, maybe not as much as I intended, but um, I, I just want to say thank you for your, your time and attention for inviting me here. I've had an excellent visit despite uh, the less than ideal circumstances, but I have promised everyone I've talked to that as soon as I can, I will schedule a trip to, to Michigan campus and and try to meet with people in person. So I've, I've been there a couple of times and, and I've enjoyed all my visits. So i look forward to the next one. Thank you so much for the great presentation. And yeah, if you have any questions, maybe we can use the raise hand feature button on the, on the reactions and proceed with the questions. I'm definitely not driving this. So if anyone's asking questions, I don't know about them. I'm trying, actually, I'm trying to get out of it. Go ahead and ask a question uh, straight in the old fashioned style. Uh, <laughs> I just had a, the, what happened in Christchurch with those buildings, um, uh, kind of performing as expected by code, but actually being damaged is kind of like a very interesting case study on all of our codes to now. Um, I don't know if you had any kind of uh, insight to what happened after that. I mean, how did they kind of solve it? What happened you know, after kind of people got unhappy about it? Yeah. Um, so the, you know, New Zealand is, it's a great country, by the way, and I, I wish I had visited not during a national disaster, but, um, you know, the New Zealanders are, are uh, they're very committed to earthquake risk uh, kind of resilience and, and, and being a rather small country, um, they're very fast acting. <laughs> um, when you have sort of 4 million people who live there, um, you can make things happen. You know, New York City is twice the size of that. Um, and we can't get anything done in any reasonable amount of time. So, the, you know, I, I think the point is that, that the New Zealand, you know, the, the, the stakeholders and, and the decision makers in government have actually prioritized uh, changes to, uh, to, to the way that their codes are, are, are targeted. Um, that said, I don't know the tangible benefits as of yet as to you know, how that's changed in, in practice. Um, but I do know from, from colleagues in New Zealand that, that Christchurch was a wake up call for the engineering community and, and for society to, to really um, you know, take a hard look at what's acceptable risk and what, what is enough. Because um, what was decided was that's not okay. <laughs> um, and, and I think anyone who's there and who witnessed that, who walks around the town, I mean, Christchurch, you know, there are people who moved away from Christchurch after the earthquake who will never come back. They have permanently left that, that city. And that's, you know, from an urban sort of health standpoint and vibrancy uh, and just an economic standpoint, it's, it's debilitating. And I, actually, I think Chrysler has, has recovered uh, reasonably well compared to forecasts, <laughs> is my understanding. There are some pretty dire predictions about, you know, generations being affected by this. I think it's actually been a very resilient community, in large part, I think, because of the, the people <laughs> uh, were very resilient. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I heard that even for those buildings which were damaged, even if there were possibilities to recuperate them, repair them, people actually just didn't feel comfortable in them. So even if the building performed as it was supposed to perform, was recuperable, most of them just wanted some torn down and built from zero. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think that psychologically that's a very natural thing, right? If, if, <laughs> if, if you have reason to believe that something's not safe, no matter how many people supposedly who would to know tell you otherwise, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to not believe them. <laughs> and and um, so I think that's maybe a lot of the public outreach too, is to educate the public as to what you're doing to keep them safe. Because I think people rightly uh, would be concerned if they watch their city crumble or you know, near, nearly crumble in an earthquake. Um, so no, it's, it's, I think it's a very important point. And also you know, the insurance industry uh, was affected quite a bit um, just because you, know, you have a state yeah. insurance pool 
that collects money for a certain event. And then if the event causes 10 times as much loss as you expect, how do you pay that? And uh, it's actually, I think most of the issues in, in New Zealand have revolved around insurance claims and, and not necessarily about the performance of the buildings. And sorry if you can hear a, a siren, but being in New York City, it's an occupational uh, hazard <laughs> about once every 10 minutes or so. But thank you for the question. That's, that's really good insight and important topic to bring up. I'd like to read more up on the mission, um, the last part of your portion of your presentation of like measuring wildfire risk and um, using that to pick which buildings to shut down electricity to. Um, yeah. Where can I find more of that information? Right. Um, so to be honest, it's it's very much something that we are helping the utility with. Um, and it's not been formalized for public consumption in much detail, but there are some some things I can share um, that will kind of, you know, it might not teach you how to go do this tomorrow, but it'll definitely give you an idea of how the framework is, is meant to be used and some of the, like the some of the mathematical background, which I think is really interesting. And uh, you know what I'll do is um, I've been taking notes. I'm probably just going to send to the organizers um, things of interest <laughs> based on what I'm hearing, and then they can be you know, hopefully disseminated to the to the students or to, frankly to anybody <laughs> of interest but um, I will definitely put that on my my little my little cheat sheet of things to, to send out okay uh, if there is uh, is there any more questions if not maybe 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 to follow up one more Troy um, so the, the you know a lot of the things you're you know you kind of are mentioning are big economic disasters in the end of the day you know even when we you know we do okay maybe with preserving life but, but the economic costs of of you know i think even the the sandy disaster and, and of course earthquakes there um are just so big um and it's often difficult for the individual stakeholders to plan out ahead and try to make those decisions do you know, is ERI doing something in that regard to try to basically stimulate this from a you know, top-down approach to, uh, to encourage basically design for, with, with a financial incentive in mind? Uh, yeah, very, -term financial. yeah that's, a really, that's a really good point. And I think that for, the answer is yes. And, and that is actually central to ERI's mission because you know, individuals or even a, a firm or even a town you know, can't really kind of effectuate uh, the kind of changes that might protect an entire state or country from, from the economic effects of earthquakes. So ERI has um, committees that are meant to develop, A, develop guidelines that can then be used um, by the insurance industry, um, by code committees. Because um, really like if ASC 7, for example, uh, effectively creates a performance-based uh, design framework that would protect economic losses or gives, that, gives engineers that ability that would have direct effects, right? Maybe not tomorrow or a year from now, but that's that's a thing that will become codified and will effectively become part of the laws. Um, so, you know, code changes are something that ERI definitely, uh, you know, promotes and has committee work focused on it. Um, but also like public policy uh, initiatives, um, you know, uh, public, because for example, if you, if you, if you educate the public on, on earthquake risk and, and say, listen, these are the, these are the expected losses in, you know, uh, greater Los Angeles in the case of a 7 point earthquake magnitude on, in this location, you know, you're looking at, you know, 5,000 fatalities and 60, you know, billion in loss. And I made the, those numbers up from way out of left field. Don't quote me on them. But if people hear that and it's from a reputable source that has backing behind it, uh, that can sort of demonstrate that this is a real issue and not some, you know, scaremongering, you know, uh, attempt or something, people will then demand their elected officials to make those changes. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated thing. And, you know, for example, the, some of the LA ordinances that have been focused on, on retrofit of non-ductile concrete buildings, you know, these are, these are attempts to, to make statutory rules to force owners to then upgrade their buildings, but without necessarily giving them the money to do it, right? You can imagine what a, what a, a, a really difficult political sell that is, right? What, what politician is going to say, you know what, you know what's my platform? I'm going to tell people they have to send money they don't necessarily have right? You're not going to get a lot of traction and you're probably not going to get reelected. Um, so that's been the challenge is to make those changes happen at a high level in a way that's sort of sustainable. And that is even frankly, even doable, you know, I mean, you have to turn an unsolvable problem into one that's solvable. 
And, and ERI and other organizations are trying to do that, but I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, a, um, it's a fraught uh, set of challenges that have a lot of people involved. Um, and uh, that just adds to the kind of like complex systems that have a high likelihood of failure. <laughs> complex social systems also have a high likelihood of not working the way you would like. <laughs> um, so, you know, just another, another log on the fire, so to speak. Thanks, Troy. Thank you. Um, and, and yeah, like I, I've said before to all of you, uh, you know, I'm here on behalf of ERI, but I'm also here to make connections with, you know, fellow professionals and future professionals uh, and academics in this field. And, and I'm very much about, uh, you know, being a part of your network and, and being a resource uh, as your careers develop and, uh, and for any other reason. So please uh, feel free to keep in touch and uh, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any more question? Yeah, if not, then I would like to thank Troy uh, again. And you can uh, just want to let you know, you can access the recordings uh, through the websites. It can be ERI website and all of the record, uh, seminars under the Friedman Family Visiting Professional can be uh, watched through that. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you.